This podcast is a member of the Place to Be Nation family. Visit us at placetobenation.com. The only place to be in your pop culture world. Binge, please. Binge. Binge, please. Binge. Hello, and welcome to Binge, Please. I'm your host, Todd Weber. Welcome back. If this is your first time here, Binge, Please is a show about streaming television. It doesn't mean I won't talk about TV in general, but I specifically focus on streaming services like Netflix, Hulu, HBO Go, and the like. On this episode of Binge, Please, I'll be talking about a couple things. The return of Game of Thrones. What to look for with Apple TV+. Plus. Season 2 of Killing Eve, and Season 2 of Cloak and Dagger. And I'll also finish the episode with an interview with my friend JT Rosero. We will be talking about the Netflix Evergreen Daredevil Season 1. But first, let's talk about Apple TV+. Plus. I'm still getting used to saying that. Apple last week had a press conference at Cupertino, their campus, and discussed the rollout of their streaming service, Apple TV+. Plus. First off, Apple TV Plus will be a original uh, service, much like Netflix, where Apple produces original content and pro- provides it to the public, and we've known this for some time now. Apple, a few years ago, st- kind of stuck their toe into the original content game with a reality-based show called Planet of the Apps, produced by Gwyneth Paltrow, and a little bit of Breaking K fabe here. My good friend Tom Coker's wife was also a producer on this show. She had previously worked on shows like Kitchen Nightmares and BattleBots. So Apple TV has also kind of co-opted James Corden's Carpool Karaoke, produced an original series there. Uh, not too different from what you'd see on James Corden's show, but Carpool Karaoke had some entertaining episodes, including one with WWE superstars that my kids watch over and over because they think it's funny seeing Triple H and Stephanie singing Enter Sandman. But Apple TV Plus uh, is going to be expanding into a full service, including shows from people like Steven Spielberg, who's been throwing shade at Netflix lately, saying that their content shouldn't be considered for Oscar awards or anything like that, but now Steven Spielberg is all in on streaming with Apple, so consider the source, consider that. Uh, Also, they'll be doing shows with people like Jennifer Aniston, Reese Witherspoon. There's not going to be a ton of established IP, though. This is going to be a lot of original content, maybe stuff based on books and things like that, but it's not like we're getting like Amazon Prime's Lord of the Rings prequel that's coming out soon. And everybody's looking forward to that, kind of to fill the void left by Game of Thrones when that ends later this year. So the presentation was kind of heavy on star power, saying these are the people that we've hooked up with to create shows for you. It wasn't like saying we're going to bring all these things to our network that uh, you've heard of before. It's more like banking on the people that they've created deals with. Also interesting things coming from Apple TV+, Plus, not necessarily content, but the actual way it's going to be delivered to you. Previously, you'd have to have either uh, iOS device, iPhone, iPad, or the Apple TV box, which I have, uh, to watch Apple TV content, buying iTunes shows a la carte, but now they're going to be taking a page out of Netflix's book and delivering that content straight to your smart TV. You know, you're going to have an app built into your Samsung or LG. Uh, If your TV is running Droid, you're not going to have access to the Apple TV app. The other thing that I thought was really interesting is that Apple will be offering cable channels a la carte. Again, there's that word uh, introduced through their app. So say I wanted to just buy a particular cable channel, say Bravo, I could have that and just pay for that and not have to pay for a full live TV streaming service like DirecTV Now or Sling, which I have, or Hulu Live TV. This would be just that network. So say you're an AMC fan, you could do that. You could watch AMC shows just 
subscribed through the Apple network. So I think that could be kind of interesting is having the freedom to pick and choose what channels you pay for. And I think that's where we're going with this. There's so much choice. There's so many streaming networks and uh, great places to get content like FX. FX Network has fantastic shows. Uh, but now you're going to have the opportunity to get those individually and kind of create what cable shows you want, your own cable queue. You know, you're not paying for networks you don't necessarily want, like Lifetime, or in my in my experience, I'd never have watched Lifetime or C-SPAN or whatever. Uh, you can just pick the shows that you want. They're actually the networks that you want and watch them like that on your Apple TV. And all signs are pointing to Apple TV rolling out in May. So keep your eyes posted. Keep listening to my show. I'll have more information because it's Apple. I'll probably try it out or at least, uh, you know, I'll get the new app because they'll automatically load it on. And we'll see. I don't necessarily know that I'll subscribe to the Apple TV service. I mean, I'm already getting Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, CBS All Access, HBO Go, you know, uh, WWE Network, DC Universe. I'm paying for a lot of stuff already. I don't know that Apple TV will have a whole lot of things that may, will make me go, okay, I'm going to spend my money on this. Although uh, Spielberg's Amazing Stories anthology could be interesting. I was a big fan of the original <laughs> Amazing Stories, which was based on an old IP of anthology magazines back in the day. Well, in the 80s, there was Amazing Stories on NBC, I believe, was the network that it came out on, and there were some great episodes of that. It was kind of like a Twilight Zone, but maybe a little more optimistic and a little bit less mystery. So we'll keep our eyes open for Apple TV+. Plus. Coming soon, we'll be looking at Disney+. Plus. We're going to learn a lot more about Disney+. Plus. Some interesting news about that dropped recently. I'll cover that on my next show. That'll be kind of the, the main headline topic. We'll be talking about Disney+, Plus because that one does sound like... A lot of people are going to be subscribing to that and, you know, um, it might even be considered something that people switch to from Netflix. Again, we're looking at, you know, what are we paying for? Is it worth it? Well, you know, there are ways to get Netflix free. I guess uh, T-Mobile has a, an opportunity to do that. Uh, you can now get Hulu free a couple different ways if you're a Sprint mobile user you have access to free hulu the basic version also if you are a spotify premium user you can now get hulu for free and again i love hulu uh it offers some things that no other streaming service does that is uh network shows on demand which is pretty cool so i can watch the shows i watch on the network things like the goldbergs which i watch on hulu every time it's on modern family just because i have years invested in modern family and once in a while, there's still a very well-written episode, even though some of the people on Modern Family just really drive me crazy. And it's uh, actually the kids. The kids on Modern Family are terrible. Anyway, it's a big weekend for Game of Thrones fans. Of course, Game of Thrones, the final season, eight, I believe it's six episodes, will start dropping on Sunday, April 14th. Game of Thrones Episode 1, Season 8 will have dropped, so you may have already watched when you've heard this. I'm looking forward to the series finishing up. Uh, it has been one of my favorite shows, although in my opinion the consistency has been a little rough. There's never been another show like this. Uh, fantasy with a big budget and compelling story and rated R content. Uh, Game of Thrones was a big gamble when it came out from HBO, but it caught on very quickly. Word of mouth was great on that show. I watched the first episode, and then I watched it again, and then I watched it again, and I was hooked. It took me a couple times watching Game of Thrones to get the characters, you know, to know the difference between the Stark boys, you know, they had Rob, John, Theon, all kind of very similar that first few episodes. It took a while to know what was going on, and as that season progressed, you knew that this was something very special. In fact, even that pilot episode, the very last scene of the pilot, you knew you were in for something amazing. So Game of Thrones has had some of my favorite characters of all time, probably uh, Tyrion Lannister is most likely my favorite character. I also like Jamie Lannister quite a bit. The Hound, Sandor Clegane, 
and uh, maybe Arya a little bit, although sometimes it's kind of annoying the way she is portrayed. But I'm a big fan of Game of Thrones. I am very much looking forward to season eight. I found season seven to be somewhat frustrating. They had to move a lot of pieces around to set up this final season, but they brought a lot of characters together, and that was ultimately very satisfying to see, you know, the first meeting of people like Daenerys and Jon Snow. They've already announced work on prequels to Game of Thrones that we'll be seeing on HBO. They want to keep that cash cow going. So hopefully the quality of those prequels will be up to par with the Game of Thrones series that we all know and love, or at least I know and love. Uh, would love to talk Game of Thrones with a guest on here one of these days. So if you are a big Game of Thrones fan, let me know. Maybe you can uh, come on to Binge Please and we'll talk G-O-T. Killing Eve is back for season two. Uh, first episode just dropped. That show is on BBC America, and I believe you can also access it on the AMC app. I thought the first season was outstanding. Amazing performances from Sandra O oh and a newcomer Jodie Connor, of course, as the villain of the show, VNL. You should check out Killing Eve Season 1, which is now on Hulu. So if you haven't seen Killing Eve, get up to speed. Kind of my official recommendation this segment, what to watch, Killing Eve Season 1, if you haven't seen it. It's on Hulu. Check it out. I guarantee you won't be disappointed. I'm a big fan. I will be kind of binging the Season 2 after a few episodes drop and I get caught up on some other things. Currently doing a Game of Thrones Season 7 rewatch, as I was talking about and catching up on DC's Legends of Tomorrow, which you can access for free on the CW app. If you're a fan of Killing Eve, let me know. I'd love to talk about that show with you. Uh, We will talk about how Season 2 is shaping up in weeks to come on this show. Also dropping last week, Cloak and Dagger Season 2 on Freeform, the first episode. Anyway, actually it was a two-part season two episode and i was unfortunately not that thrilled with it took a little while to get going i don't think it really ever truly uh was as compelling as some of the things we saw in the first season although the first season wasn't always perfect it was much better than i expected and it was a show i was really looking forward to so hopefully the quality of season two will pick up a little bit i always get a little bit of new orleans nostalgia when I watched that show because it's set in New Orleans. I went to WrestleMania at New Orleans last year. Wonderful time. Uh, Hard to disentangle my watching of Cloak and Dagger with my experience in New Orleans. Although uh, I don't think they've gone to Bourbon Street and puked their guts out just yet. What's nice is that even if you aren't a cable watcher, you have access to some freeform shows like Cloak and Dagger on Hulu. It's included in your Hulu subscription. So you can watch Cloak and Dagger on demand on Hulu season two. I enjoy the leads. They are young and inexperienced actors, but they definitely fill those roles. And Ty and Tandy, Cloak and Dagger is, of course, an adapted Marvel property doesn't necessarily have any real ties to some of the other Marvel TV shows we've seen other than Roxxon. The Roxxon Corporation is instrumental in the origin of Cloak and Dagger. But other than that, we don't really get a lot of Marvel references on that show. Still, better than average TV. Uh, If you like Runaways, also on Hulu, another adapted Marvel show, you probably will like Cloak and Dagger. And I'll still be watching it. I just hope that the quality improves. So that's about it for the news. Uh, What has my wife been watching? This is a new segment I wanted to talk about. My wife uh, is a teacher and she goes to bed early, so she puts on something and falls asleep to it. Lately, she has been watching Chill with Bob Ross on Netflix. Of course, Bob Ross is a genteel, very soft-spoken painter who you'd see on PBS back in the day. You'd turn on PBS and quite (laughs) frequently Bob Ross would be painting something with his happy little trees. And people love the show, sometimes ironically because it's just so ridiculous, but it's also very relaxing. So if you're into that kind of thing, chill with Bob Ross, 
try falling asleep to it. It seems to work for my wife. So I encourage you to check out Chill with Bob Ross if you're looking for something to fall asleep to that you don't have to invest a whole lot in. It's kind of the same thing every time. He paints a landscape, paints uh, mountains and trees, and it's, you know, if you've seen one, you've pretty much seen them all. But it's fun. It's comfort food for you if you're going to try to fall asleep. All right, that's it for the first half of the show. When we return, I will be joined by my good friend JT Rosero. We'll talk about Daredevil Season 1, which is still found on Netflix. No word whether it will be taken down. Of course, it's a co-production of Netflix and Marvel. And with Disney Plus adding some TV, they've canceled the entire Netflix Marvel Universe, as it were. You know, the Defenders, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, Jessica Jones, of course, and Punisher and Daredevil. So kind of a lame duck topic we're going to have, but it's also interesting to hear somebody who doesn't know comics, doesn't have any expectations, and what their experience is checking out a show like Daredevil and getting into a superhero TV show. So stick around. JT and I will be right back. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Place Your Nations, JT Rosero and Chad Campbell here. We want to let you know that we have over two dozen podcasts available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and PlaceFornation.com. We now offer them to you on two great feeds. On the Place Nation wrestling feed, we dive into topics running the gamut from today's WWE to the glory days of yesteryear and the ins and outs of the territory days. In addition to our full-length shows, we also deliver to you special pod blasts on topics old and new. The Place to Be Nation pop feed is a veritable treasure trove of great content. Offer tremendous shows covering the land of movies, television, life, comics, and sports. Brought to you by the most knowledgeable and insightful folks in the podcast world. You can find all these great shows, plus archives of our past podcasts from over the past eight years as well, by subscribing to both feeds on iTunes. And while you're there, be sure to rate and leave feedback as well. All of these shows, plus others, available on placemedation.com, where we cover pro wrestling, sports, movies, comics, plus in-depth search projects, and much more. Be sure to support our site by using www.placemedation.com forward slash Amazon when doing your online shopping. We want to thank our friends at Bonehead's Wing Bar, ProWrestlingOnly.com, and TheHistoryOfWrestling.com as well. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr. Placemedation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world. Welcome back to Binge Please. I'm your host, Todd Weber, and this is episode three. Of course, we had a busy week yet again on Place Me Nation Pop. A lot of different shows, a little bit of something for everyone. Music, comics, movies, going to tell you all about it. Stephen Kelly, joined by Jason Sherman, they talked about Bush and Zebra Head on the latest episode of Songs with Friends. Of course, the weekly show, Hard Traveling Fanboys, is back, and they talked about Shazam, the Monster Society of Evil, written and drawn by Jeff Smith of Bone Fame. And a couple weeks ago, we did the best of Jim Ross. Jim Ross, the legendary voice of WWE, Hall of Famer, of course, uh, Great episode. You should check out J.R. Sings. Andrew and Adam talking about where the non-NBA playoff teams, including my beloved Sacramento Kings, who just fired their coach, despite winning nearly 40 games. They won 39 games, and they were expected to only win 25. Tremendous improvement from them, but they still fired their coach. We'll have to kind of keep an eye on that. Also talking about the uh, New York Knicks, <laughs> uh, D'Amato's favorite team, and Pelicans, teams like that that did not make the playoffs. Marvel Age crew, of course, including myself, Tim Capel, Nick Duke, and Russell Sellers, last but not least, are we are talking about 1970 comics going in there. That was a very fun podcast to do, talking about Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, etc., Glenn Butler was recently on Talking Pop. You get to find out a lot about Glenn, his obsession with this old house, things like that. 
great guest for Talking Pop. Geek and Sassy also had their awards show featuring Jenny Smith, Miranda Berthold, I can say that. Uh, they did their sassies, and I was able to vote for that. And some of my things even won, some of the things I picked. So great shows covering all kinds of different media, all kinds of different uh, interests here on the Pop Feed. Back to the wrestling feed, where we made our bones here at Place to Be Nation. Of course, all these shows are available on placetobenation.com. The wrestling feed had... Chain Reaction, where we talked about WrestleMania 35. We, I wasn't in there, but Nate and his guests were. We also had uh, more WrestleMania talk. Night after WrestleMania, actually immediately after WrestleMania, there was an instant reaction show put up by uh, Chris Zellner from Between the Sheets and Devin Hales of the legendary Hales wrestling family. They talked about WrestleMania 35, the night it happened. Also, one of our favorite shows on the wrestling feed is the Wrestling War Zone, talking about the Monday Night Wars. They finished off 1995, looking at Starcade 95. All great shows. Subscribe to our feeds at Place to Be Nation uh, on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. We have Place to Be Nation Wrestling, Place to Be Nation Pop. Subscribe. We also have a new contest on a show hosted by my friend Andy Atherton. Looking forward, looking back. We're doing a summer movie wager based on how well do you think you can predict this summer's movie releases performance. Uh, we all know that Avengers Endgame is going to kind of kill everything else. Don't even bother with any other any other movie. But, you know, uh, Spider-Man Far From Home is also there. There's going to be some great, great movies besides Endgame. Uh, but, of course, Endgame is what most of us, except for Tim Capel, are looking forward to. So if you want to participate in this contest, you're welcome to. Send your picks to lflbpop at gmail.com. And any movie released on or after April 26th and finishing up by September 2nd. And then you will win an appearance on Laugh-In Theater a show, which I recently guested on, where we talked about Swingers, one of my favorite movies from the 90s. So, without further ado, I'm bringing in my good friend. Here I am with my friend. I think uh, if you didn't do the drinking game, every time I say my friend, take a sw swig. But here's JT Rosero, and we talk about Daredevil Season 1. Joining me tonight on Binge Please is the founder of Place to Be Nation, the co-host of the Place to Be Nation podcast, The Mothership. He's the co-host of the Wrestling War Zone with Chad Campbell. He's also the host of Jeff Learns Wrestling, the on hiatus host of the Dad Cast on Place to Be Nation Pop. He is JT Rosero. JT, what you doing tonight? I'm excited to be here on Todd Pod. I'm not going to lie. Uh, you had Dad Cast, huh? Maybe someday. Someday. someday I'll come back. Yeah. You keep holding hope. Well, it, it, again, it's peek behind the curtain here. I am the owner of Place to Be Nation Pop podcast feed now, mm -hmm. and which I, I don't know how that happened. It just like, surprise, you're the owner now. And I have access to the statistics, and that's the most downloaded show in the history of pop is the Dadcast. All of them or just the Paw Patrol? I think I just think the, the Paw Patrol. Patrol. Just yeah, Paw Patrol. But even that was a hot one. <laughs> hashtag Paw Patrol. It's uh, <laughs> if people are looking for a Paw Patrol podcast, that's that's. Hey kids, let's listen to the podcast. <laughs> right. I do. I do wonder how many people downloaded it, thinking it was an actual Paw Patrol podcast, and then like had to turn it off five minutes in. Yeah, because the bash. We started comparing them to Beverly Hills Nine Twenty Love Triangles and stuff. So <laughs> whatever. Well, it's apt that we're talking uh, Jeff Learns Wrestling, because this is kind of the, the flip side of this. This is JT Learns Superheroes, and yes. uh, we're going to talk about Daredevil Season 1. We're going to take a look at the Netflix Marvel Universe, which is kind of a lame duck thing. You know, mm -hmm. J JT gets into it, and it gets canceled. But It's my fault. Yeah, I, I blame it. you, and I, I, we should always blame you. And mm -hmm. Many do. <laughs> So we're looking at Daredevil season one. Now, when when did you first like get the 
the itch to catch up with the rest of the world and watch <laughs> the uh, the Netflix Marvel verse, as I like to call it. Uh, all right. So last year, I wanted. I was trying to find new stuff to watch at the gym to get me through cardio. And I got into Breaking Bad. I kept like bouncing around different stuff, and I finally got into Breaking Bad. So I banged through that, flew through that, and Better Call Saul. And at, around that same time, um, I met up with you guys in New Orleans, you and Nick Duke and uh, Jennifer, and like you know, just a bunch of you people from the from the comics uh, group and the pop feed. And it piqued my interest. And um, that was around that time too that you guys all started Marvel Age. So I said, oh, you know, I'll start listening to that. And it started to pique my interest a little bit more. So when I was looking for new shows to do, uh, it was kind of thrown out in one of the chats, like, oh, you should try the Marvel shows. And so I gave it a shot, and I enjoyed it. So I, I plowed through a decent amount of them already, uh, a little bit out of order. I received some bad intel. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going to guess uh, who, who, who provided you with that information. Was it Jordan Duncan? Of course. Yeah. It's always Jordan's fault. But... Uh, it was someone that Scott Crisco deemed a fine lady lately. Uh, that's who gave me the bad info. But, uh, I understand. Um, so, anyway, so I uh, I did watch a little bit out of order, but it, it, I think I'm, I'm on track now. So I've watched Daredevil Season 1. I watched Jessica Jones. I watched Luke Cage. I watched Iron Fist, Defenders. And then I went back to Daredevil 2, which I should have obviously watched much earlier. Yes. And it helped me understand a lot of stuff <laughs> that I already seen. I'm like, who is Electra? I want to watch the Defenders. <laughs> I have, like, no right. Idea. Like, right. Am, I, am I supposed to know her? Um, so then I went back and watched Daredevil 2. But it's actually worked out well because now I'm watching Punisher 1. Right. And it's, it's right it's, after but Daredevil 2. Right. It was a nice flow because I saw all Punisher's like origin with Daredevil, basically. Not origin, but you know, where he started. And I went right into Punisher. So it was actually kind of cool. It's a, it's a good. So I have one more episode of Punisher as this is being recorded. I watched. Uh, I'm currently on New York Time Zone. I'm in Arizona right now for a business trip. Uh, and I watched like. Top six secret episodes. place to be nation business. Excuse me. Very top secret. Yes. Top yeah, secret. For a very important meeting. Uh, but I watched like six episodes on the flight here to almost finish the season. So on my way back tomorrow, I will watch uh, finish Punisher, and I believe Jessica Jones season two would be next as I continue to move my way through. I'm trying to think. I think that Jessica Jones two happens before Punisher, but I could be wrong. I'm trying to uh... no, no. I think I ended up looking it up officially. Okay, I think it's Jessica Jones two is next, and then. Hang on, I got a list. I've, if you I've just go by the notes. release date, you're in good shape because the release yeah. date is. It's not like there's there's time travel or anything like that. All right, so what I have left is Jesse Jones two, then Luke Cage two, Iron Fist, Iron Fist two, two, Daredevil three, and Punisher two. Yeah, Punisher two, and then I guess Jessica Jones three. All right, is going to be coming. It's out. coming, and that'll be it. That'll put like a pin right. in the whole thing. And I'm I'm okay. curious, you know, to see Netflix owns these shows with the Marvel characters. Are they going to still be even though? These characters are, are no longer going to be – no more new episodes. Are, are these going to be available forever on Netflix? I don't know. Hopefully. Hopefully. Right. So they got to be available somewhere because the overall quality is pretty tremendous. Yeah, I hope so, at least for me to finish selfishly. <laughs> I'm not going to be pissed if they all vanish. <laughs> uh, I mean, is there a chance they're going to reignite them on the Disney thing or is, are they dead? Like are these actors all done and that's it? It seems like they're all moving on. They're sa- selling all the props and the costumes and things and – by the time that the rights situation clears, it'll be five years from now. So, oh, okay. you know, it, it's, it's unfortunate. It kind of sucks. Yeah. Quality is pretty great, but the cost involved for Netflix to keep licensing these characters from their competitor, you know, they're, it, it was Netflix's mm-hmm. call to, to right. cancel these, but it's a complicated situation. It's kind of a way they can stick it to Disney at least and sabotage them somewhat. You know, whatever small amount. Everything going okay down there? Yeah. <laughs> Someone is outside the, the hotel room yelling and honking the horn. Oh, good times. That, that's good quality that you were able to pick that up. I did. I did um, hear that. Yeah. Was, the La Quinta, yeah. strange things are afoot. I am in downtown uh, Scotts, old, old town Scottsdale, I should say. So. Spring training's wrapped up, so none of that. Yeah, it's sad because I think the Giants feel, yes. Todd, is like down the street from where I'm staying, but. Yeah, the the All Stars. There's Buster Posey and nobody, and Madison Bumgarner and nobody. That team is done, mm. been done. But yeah. you know, it's kind of the trade off. We got three rings in five years, 
So everything else is gravy. They're, they're not going to be competitive for a long time, and that's okay with me because I, I I would have never believed that we got three and five. So yeah, so you know. rebuild and you'll be ready for the next run. So back to Daredevil. Speaking of the first season and mm-hmm. the Daredevil concept, had you seen the Ben Affleck Daredevil movie? No, I am a very novice comic person. I've, I saw one of the Fantastic Four movies. Uh, I've seen. <laughs> I saw the, the Good Batman's. I've seen those. The Good Batman's. Um, yeah. Yes, and I saw the Tobey Maguire Spider Man's. All three with. No, I don't think I saw the last one. What's okay. the last Sandman? Is that the second one? Sandman is the third one. Okay, then yeah, I saw all three. Because mm-hmm. I like Thomas Hayden Church. <laughs> so I saw well, that one. Sideways. Sideways is an all-timer. In... Uh, Ned and Stacy. Ned and Stacy. Really? Not not, not Wings? <laughs> yeah, Wings was great, too. <laughs> um, that, was, that was my jam on USAM when I was in college. We'd get back from class, watch Wings, watch Ned and Stacy. Uh, that was one of the show on that. But anyway... Um, I, I Ned and Stacy is a big blind spot for me. So oh, you good. know, Deborah Messing and and Thomas Hayden Church. Wow, oh, quality actors. Yeah. So uh, no, so I didn't know much. Like I knew Daredevil. I knew the movie existed. Like I, it was in my consciousness, but I knew nothing of the of the comic itself. I don't think my brief run with Marvel Unlimited while I was reading comics last summer. I don't think I got <laughs> to any Daredevil on my login. Uh, I believe. Yes. Uh, no. Then I had my own though for a bit. Okay. I did. Um, and then I, I just wasn't using it enough uh, time crunch, but, um, yeah. So no, I, I didn't know much about the character. Like I didn't know he was blind. <laughs> like, right. Surprise, that. surprise. Yeah. Did yeah, you? Yeah. Now, now the actor is not blind, right? No, the Charlie Cox playing? is not okay. blind. Um, and you probably never seen him in anything. He didn't ring a bell for you. No, not really. Uh, I was looking at his Wikipedia page early, earlier to try and get a feel. Cause I was mm-hmm. trying to figure out the blind thing. Cause he does a good job. He, oh, he's great. He he's very compelling. At yeah. being blind. Yes. He's a, uh, it would have not have shocked me if he was blind. But the Daredevil action scenes, I don't know that he necessarily could have pulled those off. Because, well, I thought maybe it could have been like a stunt guy. Yeah, yeah. The only thing I knew of him from was a movie called Stardust, which is a pretty good date movie based on a comic book. Also, also mm-hmm. a Neil Gaiman comic book, kind of Sandman ancillary, kind of an adult adult story. Uh, Robert De Niro is a cross dressing pirate. Good film. Yeah, of course. yeah. But uh, that's the only thing I knew him from, and he's I guess British. Yeah, he's British, and he. You wouldn't know that from his uh, vaguely, vaguely New York, Boston, Irish accent. So no foggy, I wouldn't. <laughs> well, you you picked it up better than I do. I, I have a hard time with that when, unless it's something like Walking Dead, where it's so obvious that the English right. guy is putting on an American accent. No, I can never tell the accents. Like I, I mean, Nicole Kidman put it by me for a long time too. So mm-hmm. yeah, you know, I'm not good at that. But yeah, no, he's really good. I, I do enjoy him as the character. Uh, I, I like the watch. I think it's a pretty well casted show. I think uh, Wilson Fisk is, is yeah. excellent. And I, I think uh, the, yeah. season season one uh, is just as much about Wilson Fisk, the kingpin. Oh yeah. And uh, again, he's not somebody you had anybody any reference for on your radar. He was started out as a Spider Man villain, you mm-hmm. know, one of the classic seventies, late sixties, early seventies Spider Man villains, and kind of moved his way over to Daredevil. His his particular. Uh, Corporate crime fits really well with the the lawyer aspect of, of Daredevil, right. and so he became his arch arch nemesis. And D'Onofrio is fantastic in this. Uh, mm-hmm. So I, I I think between those two performances, they carry the show. But everybody else is pretty good too. Yeah, even though he looks like a giant man baby, but I guess that kind of goes. That's with the, the, character, the character, yeah. Right? yeah. And I mean, and that that's as as well as they could make it make it run. Um, it's a very cartoonish look in the comics. Like he's mm-hmm. huge. He's even fatter, even wider. You know, the, the kind of the gimmick is that he's more like a sumo. You know, he's not just a fat guy, but he's a big fat muscled guy, uh, okay. you know, tremendous athlete. And they didn't, they didn't do a whole lot of that, but the character is really compelling. You know, you mm-hmm. learn about his origin and his uh, father issues growing up and yes. mother issues too. And, and he even gets some romance in. he gets to pursue Vanessa. Yes. So, so you see him putting on a big mask, or is he more being himself when he's pursuing uh, and and courting this art dealer Vanessa? 
Yeah, I, I, I saw it as like that almost being a stand-in for his mom, right? Uh-huh. I mean, that's yeah, the kind of gets absolutely. Feel, is that it, so, yeah, I do think it's when he's at his most real because uh, he feels like he has this woman, you know, motherly figure that he hasn't had in a while right. that he can confide in and be honest with. And besides uh, Wesley, who is almost like a son that he never had, like yeah. he's kind of his son figure, um, seems to be the only two people that he really feels like comfortable completely opening up with and trusting and uh, so I thought that part was interesting too. So he kind of loses the father, you know, hates his father, his mother's sick and he's kind of hiding her away. And then he finds this woman who can kind of mother him as a giant man, baby. And then <laughs> uh, little Wesley who can, uh, right. Be poor, right poor Wesley did not end well for him. Yeah. So that, sh- that shocked me, right? So I've gotten used to it now that I've watched like six or seven about uh-huh. how willy nilly that they'll eliminate people Just boom, uh, so get gone but it did it did catch me off guard when he got shot i thought i guess are we spoiling or we're okay no we, we're oh yeah i'll give i'll give a spoiler notice but it's come on it's 2015 this four four years old at this hey point. i would have been pissed if i heard this now <laughs> okay. I mean, um right yeah but uh, two shocking deaths wesley's and i'd say uh the reporter ben urich is yeah, I had a feeling he was going to go as it went on. Um, but I thought Wesley would at least last like through the season, uh, being Fisk's kind of you know yeah. top dog. And even the, even at the pace, they killed off the rest of the crew, like the Russians, and then uh, Leland. You know, like, like and I was surprised that they were taking them all out. The one thing I like, and this goes beyond that season of Daredevil that they've done well, is working multiple arcs into these seasons. Yes, uh, where it seems like you know even like this second daredevil where the whole first half is about punisher before you even get fist coming back so they've been able to fill the 13 episodes by bridging these multiple stories in where you think okay this guy may be the big bad it happened in luke cage too right with the, yes the two uh, different Cotton villains Mouth, right? the two different two different yeah. arcs so I, I like that part of it too how they work through the stories that way yeah sometimes you can tell when a, a they're just stretching things out and decompressing it and filling for time. And that's not the case here. They're, they've they got a, a plan and they uh, balance it enough with the different yeah. characters, with the different plot lines. And uh, pretty good violence, pretty good action on Daredevil, wouldn't you say? Yeah, for sure. Uh, across the board. I, I think the fights are good. Um, you, it, it's funny because you get... <laughs> Like it's very, everything's very karate based in this universe, yes. right? When you go from this to Iron Fist and everything else, and the hand is all yeah, martial place. arts so, definitely, and, and ninjas and and martial arts in general, yeah, yeah. So you kind of get used to that being it. And it's funny because I was actually thinking today how watching Punisher has been kind of nice because I was kind of getting a little sick of the hand <laughs> like everywhere. Like, so it's actually been kind of cool that it was like a different level of um, villainy. It wasn't just all. I mean, I do like how they everything tied back to them across the universe. It, it brings that feel mm-hmm. to it, but. This was actually kind of nice, like for a break from fucking Gao and like, all that, <laughs> all that shit. Um, yeah, although Madam Gao kind of grows on you. Oh yeah, no, she's great. Uh, I just needed the break. It was cool to to get away from it and get into the army stuff. I thought it was pretty interesting. But yeah, and these uh, I keep veering us off. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's a, no, that's, that's great. We're we're developing and talking about the wider universe. These Daredevil shows is this Daredevil Defenders universe. I guess we can call it. Uh, yeah. started in the late seventies in comics from Frank Miller's Daredevil work. So some of it sticks very, very closely to the canon, to the, the comic book origins. But for instance, we were talking about Ben, like you, you knew Ben was a goner, the, the reporter, uh, he mm-hmm. was still alive in the comics as an informant, as a, uh, somebody like a, a reference for Daredevil, a, a contact for him. So, right. you know, that, that was why that was kind of a shock to me, a kind of a twist okay. to me. So filling out the supporting cast, we have a few other characters. We have Deborah Ann Wall as Karen Page, the kind mm-hmm. of secretary. She's an abuse victim, and uh, she becomes kind she of a reporter the, as we go. But So what, what I do is compare the to an hour in my life. With okay. Who's she? She's very Ke- very Kelly Taylorish because she has, goes through hell. Like, you know, Kelly got shot. She had the baby, the miscarriage. Uh, have a drug addiction, but I feel like poor Karen. Like every every fucking scene, she's either getting shot at, kidnapped across all of them. Whether it's the Fed, yeah, Daredevil, Punisher, uh, Punisher too. Punisher. Yep, <laughs> yep. Yeah, she's she is um, often the damsel in distress. Yeah, she's, she takes a beating. It's funny because the very first scene where she's being like interrogated, it, it stuck out to me how blonde they made it stand out, <laughs> which I thought was interesting uh, cinematography. It, it like her eyebrows and like kind of this like light facial hair like kind of um, uh-huh. 
like like they really lit it. So like the blonde really stood out with kind of like how pale they made it. Like it was just an interesting way to start the show. It was like one of the first things that stuck with me was the way they really tried to emphasize the framing of her face. I don't I don't know if I'm explaining it well, but if you go back and watch that first scene, she's like very the blonde is like really dramatic, like her mm-hmm. eyebrows and face. It's interesting. I, I think I think uh, they did a little dye job. She's a strawberry blonde uh, redhead. And the only thing I knew her from before was True Blood. Did you ever see see that show back in the day? No, I did not watch True Blood. Uh, HBO, so I know she was on it. HBO Southern Gothic Vampires. Yes, kind of an I interesting it, show. <laughs> kind of an interesting thing. Uh, she had a great, great cosplay as Red Riding Hood. So if you ever get a chance to check that out, I would recommend okay. that. That would be a, a date night special. So... She's paired up against uh, the other partner of the Murdoch and Nelson law firm, and that's Foggy Nelson, played mm-hmm. by Ethan Somebody. Uh, I I forget I've never seen this actor before, but apparently I had Eldon Eldon Hanson. That's his name. And the Foggy character is kind of schlubby in the comics, and they make him more of like a uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman light in this. Yeah, he does remind you of that. And I just, I, I'm looking at it now. Holy shit, he was Fulton Reed in The Mighty Ducks. So well, yeah, he was Fulton. a child actor and he had a couple things leading into this, but uh, Hunger Games too, apparently, which I didn't know. Mm. No. But I, I, I would just kind of project, oh, this is this is the kind of role, if you couldn't get Philip Seymour Hoffman before he died to play, this would be a perfect perfect role for him. But I see that in there. So, yeah, um he he's a good loyal friend. He's got kind of the comic relief aspect of it too. Uh, he and Matt have their ups and downs, but he he's a solid character. Again, in the comics, somebody has a ton of mother issues, you know, right. um, and then he ends up working for the corporation at the end. There's more spoilers. Uh, does he do that at the end of as Daredevil, or is that are we spoiling a later series? No, you did at the end of two. Okay, um, boy, I'm, I'm and then gone. into Defender. So. The- so to me, there was like a big gap missing because when I started watching Defenders, I'm like, all right, when did he start working there? And like, when did Karen find out? And all that. So that, you know, that's when I started to realize I was maybe out of order. Uh, when I started watching <laughs> Defenders. Yeah, he's not working for, for them in the, the uh, very cheap offices of, of Murdoch and Nelson, Nelson and Murdoch. So, yeah. Um, well, and then it, there was something else too that stood out. It was, one, it was when. Um, and then I watched Daredevil 2, which I don't think I realized how early it was when I should have watched it. But like, because like he's explaining to Claire who the fist was, uh, the fist, who the hand was. The hand. And uh, I'm like, wait, she already knows. She's been hanging out with Iron Fist. <laughs> Colleen. <laughs> uh, and then I realized that Daredevil should have been way earlier uh, than all these other ones. So that, that's when I started to really figure out that, wait, I've, I'm like way the fuck off track here. Because yeah. I'm like, how, does, how do these people not know these things? It's kind of like in the movies. Ambiguous. Where Iron, Iron Man 2 came very early. You know, you don't watch Iron Man 2 along with the, the second sequels. It's, it's like right. they got the ones that worked out, you know, and then then all the other sequels came in. So, yeah, Daredevil 2 is relatively very early in, in this universe. It is. And then the interesting thing is at the end, he tells her he's Daredevil. But then we get the Defenders and, like, I guess, I mean, I guess it's fine. They're not, like, beating you in the head with the, you know, sledgehammer. But, like, her and Foggy are all, like, like, Matt's been the rehab of Daredevil, basically. Like, you know, yeah. he's, oh, is he back doing it? I thought we had beaten that. Like, but they don't ever show them trying to get him to stop doing it and, like, make him rehab himself. Like, they just kind of get there, which I thought was weird, too. Like, they kind of yeah. just assume we're knowing that. Yeah, you can't can't fix him. The thing about Daredevil is that makes him maybe a little bit different is he's clearly religious. He starts out in a confessional. Yes. And so that aspect, you know, the Irish uh, thing, you'd, you'd think this character could be a cop in a different reality, but he, he ends up being a lawyer, ends mm-hmm. up being, um, well, even it starts with his origin, you know. And did you, were you aware of the tie between uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Daredevil? No, I am not. Okay, so. I'm intrigued. <laughs> so the accident that creates Daredevil, he gets hit by a truck. And yes. the toxic waste spills on him. His dad finds him and carries him. Well, that toxic waste runs down the gutter and um, is used as the basis for the origins of the Ninja Turtles and Splinter. Is that real, or are you just are people just like a fanfic of that? It, well, it started out as a fanfic. It said, you know, what if this happened in a different? Right. It was a different comic company, a different comic universe. But that that was the basis. They didn't obviously name names as Daredevil, but you read those early Teenage Mutant Ninja. 
I can't even say it. I'm, I'm, I'm ahead of T T M N T. There we go. Mm -hmm. Comics. And they're definitely in the style of Frank Miller's seventies daredevil, uh, seventies or eighties daredevil. And you know, it's absolutely on purpose, you know, an homage to the daredevil fighting the hand stuff. So, Mm. yeah, it's a, I mean, I did think, you know, with all the foot soldiers and the ninja stuff, like it, it definitely, you know, echoes it like you can see it for sure yeah no it, it's um, it's intentional they just don't you know it, it's an unofficial crossover it's an unofficial thing um right. you even have in daredevil you have stick and ninja turtles you have splinter right yes very similar, so yeah. what'd you think of stick he was kind of a dick right oh yeah big time but uh he's good in the second one in the second season and defenders um the first we don't see him too much right it's pretty much just one episode it's just the one episode where he saves him and and helps him i think right and we yeah I, you know it, it does run together when you've seen him all but I, I, i'm just right. focusing on the you know your first impressions of him um love the actor for stick he, mm-hmm. he's been you know he jack crawford in silence of the lambs he's done a ton of things uh he's, he gets work you know he's, he's never out of work scott glenn has right, been right. In, in so many things, even going back to the right stuff, I remember. Um, yeah, great casting for that. I didn't necessarily buy him as a physical badass, but his his attitude carried through. And uh, right. you even get – talk about some of the, the showcase action scenes, the hallway rescue scene where in episode two, I don't know if you remember that, early on. It's Daredevil before he gets his costume. He's got kind of the mm-hmm. ninja hood on. And yep. it that, that – it's like a one-take – scene through the hallway it was so well choreographed that yes. uh you you buy in like this is going to be really high quality stuff even better than what you would see on like the cw's arrow which is not a show you have a reference for but um, right and then there was another fight against i forget the characters and, and maybe the uh, japanese dude with the chain nobu nobu yeah. there we go yeah that was a good one yeah yeah, quite quite a bit, and they they call back into that in season two, also. So it's it's nice that they have these lower level or or mid bo- mid level bosses that you know right. uh, can, he, can I know occupy. He gets, I know he gets regenerated, but he's not one of the hand people, right? He's just like a underling of them, but they bring him back because I know he they think he's dead in the first one. He comes back yeah. in the second one, yeah, but he, he's not one of the five, right? No. He yeah. is because there's another Japanese guy, the one that eats <laughs> is like the cook, <laughs> like uh, defenders. That and that's I think the black, not the black sky, but see, I don't want to. I'm I'm still focusing on one. I haven't haven't thought about defenders in a bit. I have to go okay. go check it out. We can double. So check. the other thing that got me too is defenders Alexandria or Alexandra, whatever it is. Right, like, Sigourney Weaver. She's not talked about at all. No, no, they just present her like oh. She's overseeing this whole kid. thing. It's kind. Of, it kind of felt like it was out of nowhere, you know. This, it did. this, uh, and, and then, but I did like the the reveal of the end of season two that they were all trying to get Electra, and then it doesn't pay off as well as you'd like it to in right in Defenders. That should be huge, and it just does. It kind of falls flat. But we can yeah. focus on that. Well, especially think- when you watch Defenders first. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, as cat's out of the bag on that. We should also yeah. talk about Claire Temple, who's probably one yes. one of my favorite supporting characters from this, and she's basically the night nurse. She's kind of the uh, the helper to all the superheroes in this universe. Where mm-hmm. she she will not reveal your secrets; she'll just bandage you up and take care of and be your confidant. Uh, great, great portrayal by Rosario Dawson, uh, one of my favorites, mm-hmm. and beautiful woman too. Uh, kind of a romantic. F- aspect between she and Matt, but it doesn't really go anywhere, right? No, not really. Like so who do you who do you ship her with of all the people? You got well you got Matt. Have you seen you got, have you seen Luke Cage season two? No, I haven't got a Luke Cage two yet. All so, right. But I, you know, she's obviously with Luke pretty much in the end of one and into Defenders. Uh but then you got Jessica. Yeah. Who, there's some sexual tension there in, in Jessica Jones season one. Um I was waiting for the three-way. May it's still to come. We'll yeah. see. Uh, I, you know, I ship her and Senator Cory Booker, actually. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Art imitates life. No, I don't know. She's she's almost presented as a perfect character, a flawless character. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. you know, you don't want to see her end up with one of the one one of our rugged crew of uh, vigilantes. Something bad would happen to her. You know, you want to protect her. She, she, she seems like better than the rest of all these people. Yeah, and it's funny, too, because... Um, I think she's portrayed well in all of them, 
But I, I thought almost Iron Fist is where they bring her the most, like get her the most involved, where she's mm-hmm. actually really getting into the fighting, and um, she's really almost like a bigger character. I felt like there than even even almost more than Luke Cage. Is. So. Yeah, and we'll we'll get into Iron Fist too. That that mm-hmm. one is very polarizing, and that that one probably could have been five episodes shorter. Yeah, in my opinion, I think Ben Daredevil season one is kind of the perfect length, and mm-hmm. uh, you know you they eventually get. Wilson Fisk into jail and uh, that last episode with the, the police chase. Um, I'm trying to think of the van. Is that? The- yes. Yep. Yeah. Tremendous. Uh, you can't just leave that uh, cliffhanger. You have to finish and watch that second, that sec those last two episodes, you have to watch them in one setting, I think. Yeah. And it was, it was really good. Um, and it almost sets the tone for the rest of the universe because it, it sets up how Daredevil refuses to kill anybody. Yeah. And not that Luke or Jessica or Danny do either, but they seem a little bit more at peace if it happens, whereas Matt like actively yeah. tries not to. <laughs> and that, that kind of sets the tone of like, if you don't kill the bad guy, <laughs> the big boss, you know, he's going to come back. come back. Yeah. And haunt you. Whereas in the other ones, like, you know, Punisher, especially is like, you know, finishing people off. They're done. Um, the, the one trope I, I did get a little tired of, especially by the time Luke Cage came around, was the dirty cops. But, like, And that was another thing I didn't mind about Punisher, is that, it, at least with the military, like it was just different, like the dirty military guys. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But like it, it was like, all right, by the time like Iron Fist came around and we're still having like you know cops on the inside, being, it was like, all right, like right, <laughs> let's get something else going on here instead of it always just being, oh, you know, we think we can trust this cop and then we can't. Like It just, right. it just kept cutting Yeah, Luke Cage, time. it was really obvious when that, before it was ever revealed, it was like, oh, you know, something's oh, going yeah. on. But it's Hell, Hell's Kitchen, too. I mean, we're hypothetically, okay. you know, they set it up like it's in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, even though there are very, very, very few interactions or mentions. Yeah, that's the kind of thing I would try to exploit if I, if I was a producer. But maybe they had very limited access to these ideas. So they're talking about this, this community is recovering after the aliens attacked in Avengers one. And it's very loose. It's not really, um, exploited a whole lot other than just saying hell's kitchen is a shitty place to live. And right. that that's kind of the setting. And that, that's why it works for daredevil. Cause he's always going to have stuff to do that. You know, you've got a corrupt legal system. You've got a corrupt police force. Uh, mm-hmm. he'll always have to put the mask on and take care of things in another way. So I'm glad you liked it. Um, I think we're going to go back and kind of look at these all like a little bit more in depth and find out more things about your opinions on these. But I'm I'm stoked that you have taken the plunge into Comicville here with us. So yeah, no, I, I mean, and this is more my speed than I, I think it, the reading is like so overwhelming because there's just so much um, and so many arcs and so many so like. This has actually been a nice bridge, uh, especially for someone who like I, I like to binge these at, at the gym. So it's like it, it it's given me something to watch there where I'm going like this is time I'm set aside anyway for something. Whereas trying to fit in the reading uh, was for me just get like time consuming is mm-hmm. where I could do it. But for this, I'm going to, to the gym to work out anyway. So this is like I was looking for something. So it's, it's filling that gap for me uh, as the place to binge a show like this. And <laughs> I, I enjoy them enough that I want to keep going and watching. So it, it's been a good balance, and it's just been like one giant movie, just watching them all yeah. in order. I know you guys had to kind of wait for like them to get released and come out one after the other, but for me, it's been like, okay, I can just move right into the next one. Like On the plane, head and back, I'll finish Punisher, and I'll go right into Jessica Jones. Like, I already have a bunch downloaded for the flight back. So um, so yeah, like that part of it's cool, that I can just, this has been one giant like. 180 hour long movie. <laughs> and I, I thought about it that way too, uh, as watching him. And then I was advised by, I, th- I didn't think it was the hard traveling fanboys. They don't see it that way. Right. And especially when Iron Fist comes in and has a totally different tone. Mm-hmm. But uh, up to that point, I think I really felt that these, these were all just continuations and they, the ways the showrunners, the producers, the directors maintain this consistent universe. I, I treat it like that. You know, I, I think of this as just, uh, Marvel TV season one, Marvel TV season two. It's just you have focus on different characters, but the tone is very consistent. The quality is very consistent, with the exception of some of the other se- seasons we'll talk about in the future. But overall, yeah. Uh, so good. I'm stoked you liked it. Um, thinking we should get together in another couple months and see where you are. 
And uh, yeah, no, definitely. I'm thinking I'm probably close to done if I keep this pace. The uh, the long flight helped. I mean, like literally, I, I got through most of the Punisher season just on the way here. So I'll probably get halfway through Jessica Jones almost by the time I get back to Rhode Island. So I'll uh, I'll be chugging along. And you're a great host because I kept veering you off to talk about everything else but Daredevil season one, and you kept bringing <laughs> us back. So that was. You did a good job there, Todd. Well, um, I appreciate it. Yeah. You know, we've known each other a long time. It's this is the first time we've had a one-on-one conversation on on the air over the air. Is it? I, I believe so. I've been on oh. as a guest on PTB, but I've never had you on one of my shows, and you've never yeah. so, solo hosted a show with me. So, well, good thing I asked myself on for this. Yeah, thing. yeah, we marked that territory pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you know, it was funny because I was like, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to be kind of bored. Uh, in the hotel, I'm, gonna be, I'm like, who do I know on Pacific time that want to do something? I'm like, oh, Todd, I should ask him if I can come on a show. Um, and I guess we could probably tease, right? I mean, you'll be right, not tease. We can announce, or you'll be on a on a PCB podcast. Like a I will be, well, so. I, but we won't be able to talk about WrestleMania experiences that we were hoping to talk about when we we booked it. I I that was scheduled initially to go to WrestleMania. I'm not going this year. I'll be hanging out in home watching it with my family and. Uh, Living vicariously through you guys and, and enjoying New York, seeing seeing you guys enjoy the, the show, the cold weather, the possible rain, uh, the miserable smells of New York City, the traffic, <laughs> all all the stuff that you know uh, make for a memorable Makes you feel trip. Better yeah, say, yeah. I, I, I'm going to keep saying those things until <laughs> until I I uh, get over it. But no, it, it's it's all good. It's going to be very good. Uh, looking at going to Tampa with my son next year. So, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm already looking forward to Tampa. Uh, D'Amato's trying to get us to drive again, but I don't know about that. We'll see. <laughs> uh, but I am, I am looking forward. To it. it was a good location. I was glad they selected it. Uh, anything, no offense to you, but anything east, I'm in for sure. So it's uh, right. Once we, if we get back to like California, it might be a little trickier for me, but I'll, I'll see what I can do. Well, you know, if you don't mind driving, if it, if it's in Northern California, you could stay here. So. Perfect. Yeah, actually, all all of you, all of you in Place to Be Nation, can come stay in my house, in my garage. Everyone. We'll convert it specially for uh, the next San Francisco, Santa Clara, WrestleMania. But no, I think uh, I think Los Angeles and Las Vegas are in the future for Mania plans in the neck with these new new arenas and better weather. Could could definitely be happening. I could absolutely see Vegas happening. Oh yeah, I think Vegas is a lock once an arena opens. Uh, or I should say, once that stadium opens for the mm-hmm. Raiders, I think I think they'll try and get in there. That's why I think they're going to do Tampa, and then I, it wouldn't shock me if Vegas is the year after that because I think it'll be open. It'll by be then. ready by then, yeah. And, and then uh, I think they're probably due to go back to Dallas, is my guess. Well, Dallas has that hundred thousand state person stadium, and mm-hmm. when we were there, it sure felt like a, there were almost a hundred thousand people there. Yeah. Oh, well, if you ask Dave Meltzer, it's probably like fifty thousand, right. but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's still still pretty good. And then um. I think they'll be back to New Orleans again before too long. I think they're going to really rotate. Rotate, like yeah. Months. Have a Florida every five years, have a New Orleans every five years, have Vegas, and then maybe some wild card places. Like, I, New I, York, yeah. No. Yeah, they, they have to come back to New York just because of the, the history. But mm-hmm. I hear people complaining about the logistics of getting around to all the different places. So Yeah, I don't think it's going to be super – I think it'll be easier than it was in 2013 – um, and back then there was no Lyft or Uber really. Right. So, that's true. Like, like, so that, I mean, it was, we were taking the fucking bus from Jersey, like into, you know, into Manhattan. Uh, but I, I think we have the logistics figure out a little bit better this time. So that's helpful. And it's just bigger than it was now. That was kind of the like earliest. I think Atlanta was technically like the first time, like a lot of other companies like started to trickle in like mm-hmm. ring of honor and stuff. But even by 29, like there weren't a ton of things around. Like, it was starting to bubble a bit. I feel like it wasn't really until, was it Dallas where it really, like, exploded? Or right. how was it in uh, in San Francisco, in uh, Silicon Valley there? Well, the, the, there were little indie shows, and there was a very small NXT show. But right. it wasn't a televised NXT. It was just the kind of thing you heard almost as an urban legend, talking to people mm-hmm. like, were you there? Were you there? It was amazing, right? Um, and then... Then Dallas, they obviously built the NXT in the Hall of Fame. There was only the Hall of Fame show here the night before in San Francisco. Right. And yeah, uh, I don't re- recall any other indie shows or anybody else capitalizing. I think Dallas was really the start of it. And we're meeting Nick and Russell out there and, and making it a whole four days. Mm-hmm. You could have made it five, six days of just nonstop wrestling. All the different companies. I got to see Ring of Honor there. I. Uh, 
where Ben Morris was working, and uh, it was it was a pretty amazing thing to be able to see quality wrestling, indie, pro, big time, the grandest stage of them all, a hundred thousand people at WrestleMania. So, yeah, no, you're right. I think that was really the first one where it exploded. So it'll be interesting to see how New York does handle it. It is pretty spread out, like WrestleCon and that stuff's like in Times Square, I think. Mm-hmm. And then there's a lot of stuff in Jersey and Jersey City. So I think people are kind of more spread out. And the one thing I loved about New Orleans was, which I don't think you're going to get as much of in New York, is the walking around and just seeing everyone. Now, Orlando was like that, too, where you just were kind of walking in this condensed area. Yes. And everywhere you looked was like a wrestling fan. And, you you know, you kind of knew where everything was. I, I, I think um, New York will have some of that because it's, it's just such a big area. Like, they're going to be spread out. But I just don't think you'll have it won't be as condensed. Like I don't think you'll be walking around Times Square and run into people who were wrestling in Jersey or you know what I'm saying? It's like right. I, I think it'll be a little different. Right, yeah. We we ran into indie wrestlers from the same show on Thursday and then later at Kevin Nash's place, they were there. Mm-hmm. Kevin, the, the Nash party, because uh, of the proximity in New Orleans. You, just, you saw the same right. people four or five times. So Okay. Well thank you for being my guest, JT. Uh, any plugs you got for me? Oh, I got plugs. Uh, what do I got? Oh, we had a new place to be podcast. Uh, I don't know when this is dropping, Todd, but we had a new place to be podcast. Um, we've had two in the last two weeks. We had Jennifer was on to do the uh, February 89 MSG, and then Peter Winston joined us for the March 89 Series Made Event. As we're really getting close to WrestleMania 5, which has been kind of cool watching the build. And I'm starting to understand that WrestleMania 5 is kind of an illogical card, Todd. We'll talk about that <laughs> when we get there. Um, there's like four matches that make sense and the rest is just like no through lines from what they yeah. were doing before that show but anyway that's for another day uh wrestling warzone we've been on a hot streak as well we have one more show for 1995 chad and i we have to do starcade and then we'll be into 96 which i'm excited about it's one of my favorite years and i'll just throw a plug out for the gwwe uh greatest pay-per-view tv match ever project you could follow it on facebook or at big 34 at probarts.com uh and basically it's just you know what we've done the last two years you submit a list of 100 at the end of the year all-time greatest WWE pay-per-view or TV matches. Uh, there's a great nomination list. I think it's easier to prep for than the last two years because you just have to watch the matches listed. You don't have to try and find the best of a certain wrestler and how many do you watch. This is <laughs> literally just watch the matches on the list, which I've been doing kind of one or two a night. So I, I got a decent little catalog built already. But uh, I like this project a lot. I think it's a lot of fun, and it'll be a lot of fun for the rest of the year. So Yeah, and uh... – is there is that just going to be on Facebook that, or are we doing stuff with our our uh, the pro boards? Yeah, it's both. So on Facebook was kind of like the nomination spot, or actually the board too. You can nominate also Facebook on the board has the list itself, and then there's also a thread for match reviews if you want to like share thoughts or, or pimp a match. So there's been a few guys in there already, like as they're watching, they're sharing thoughts on matches, yeah, which has been kind of neat. So. It's going to be a good um, kind of draft book, you know, as you work through. I like when somebody, not, not going to name names, but contemporary wrestling, when there's a great match, that particular Raw, it gets nominated that day. Correct. Oh, yeah. It's, it's right in there. Yeah. <laughs> and I think uh, I've let pretty much everything that got nominated, except for when Steve Bennett nominated all of WrestleMania 2. Yeah. Uh, that's where I drew the that's line. pretty but lazy. It's, uh, <laughs> most of it. Um, I, we had a talk. I mean, okay, but yeah, yeah no, no, most of it is. Uh, uh, but pretty much everything else I've I've added to the list. So I, I you know ninety percent of it probably won't even sniff. There's a lot of three stars and ish matches on there, but whatever. It's still a lot of fun. It's, it is. It's cool it project. is fun. It's cool discussion. It's kind of and thing. I'm sure. Place to be nation is all about you know. Yeah, stretch projects and group projects. I'm sure Aaron and I will talk some on the No Holds Barred. We'll do like we did for the last oh, few projects. I forgot to talk about No Holds Barred. That's another podcast you do. Yeah, I do too many. Well, I do too. Jennifer does too. Andy does too. Yeah, we all do. Speaking of Andy, make sure you vote in the candy tournament as well. Andy, Andy's candy. Andy's uh, candies. Yeah, this this show will drop March thirty first, so there will still be some time left to get in on that. Oh yeah, yeah. That's not going to end till uh, Easter. So stretching it out. I, so it's not exactly like the uh, NCAA. <laughs> no, li- uh, yeah, it'll end a little bit later, but. It's moving. We're into the second round now. So that drops some. There's a dedicated Facebook page, but also we've been tweeting the polls out. We've had good engagement so far, actually. I've been pretty encouraged. Um, I think we've maybe found a new way to do these tournaments uh, using social media instead yes. of the site. So. 
Yeah, and Andy does these polls, and you, you just click on what you like, and it's easy to, to follow. Uh, I don't know what's wrong with you guys not voting for Peanut Butter Twix, but... I did. I voted for it two places. I voted for it on Facebook <laughs> and Twitter, so I'm I'm spiking the uh, the ballots a little bit. Stuff it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know who would pick Caramel or Peanut Butter, but whatever. Uh. Nostalgic, that's it. <laughs> now we're becoming the hard-traveling fanboys who had a five-minute conversation about which is better, peanut butter, chocolate, or caramel. So, <laughs> Peanut butter all day. All day, every day. Mm-hmm. Even if you're allergic, it's worth it. Cool. Yes. Well, thank you for being on Binge, Please, JT. We will talk to you in the future. And thank you for listening to Binge, Please. We will see you next time. Bye. Catch a greyhound bus and